that although the materials used both in the Egyptian boats and in the Andean boats are not suitable for sailing on the open seas, the design that is incorporated in these boats could only have been evolved by a people with a long and solid tradition of oceanic navigation, people who needed boats that could cut through high waves and breakers. And the suggestion is, could this design be a very ancient legacy that was passed down and received both by the Egyptians and by the peoples of the Andes and expressed uh, in the kind of boats that they made? In both areas, such boats are associated with the gods. The ancient Egyptians called their gods the Niteru, and they said that they had come from a land far away to the south, a land called Ta Niteru, across vast expanses of ocean. So whoever they may have been, these gods, above all else, were navigators and seafarers. And navigators and seafarers need maps if they're going to sail around the Earth. Now this map is a modern map, and I picked it up at the Library of Congress in the United States. It's an azimuthal equidistant projection centered near Cairo. And in common with all modern maps, it incorporates a number of advanced features. It incorporates highly accurate longitudes, and particularly relative longitudes, and it incorporates an advanced map projection. It isn't easy to represent a spherical object, the Earth, on a flat piece of paper and to do so with a considerable degree of accuracy. And this is a problem that cartography has had to overcome. So we find good map projections which require advanced mathematics and good relative longitudes. Interestingly enough, there's a category of ancient map which also shows these modern features and which doesn't fit with the received view of the development of human history. One of the most famous of these maps is the Piri Reis map. Um, and I'm showing it uh, here because I want to compare the projection of this map with the projection here centered on Cairo. Notice the west coast of Africa and the east coast of South America. And coming down here to, to the Antarctic Peninsula, tonguing up towards the south of South America. It's uh, that precise projection that we find on this 1513 map. Again, there's the west coast of Africa, the east coast of South America. And coming down here, we find a representation of the northern Antarctic Peninsula. In 1513, when Piri Reis uh, drew the map, Antarctica had not been discovered. Uh, in fact, it wasn't discovered until 1818 by our civilization. Uh, so there immediately is one anomaly on this map. And another anomaly is the uh, mathematics used in the map projection. And a third anomaly is that it incorporates highly accurate relative longitudes. To do longitudes accurately on maps requires a chronometer, a marine chronometer that will keep accurate time at sea. And again, this was something that our civilization couldn't do until the late 18th century. So this map fragmentary though it is, uh, appears to incorporate many features that are not supposed to have been known about in 1513. Piri Reis explains why in these texts that he wrote on the map. He was a Turkish admiral and he wrote these texts on the map. And what they say is that the map is not his own work. It's a, it's a work of synthesis. It's based on more than 20 earlier source maps. Uh, that he put all these maps together and derived his own map from these. And unfortunately, the source maps that Piri Reis used have not survived. Is it possible that the advanced features of this map uh, originate in those lost source maps, which Piri Reis told us went back in some cases to before the time of Christ and had come from the long lost library of Alexandria in Egypt? Another strange thing about the appearance of Antarctica on this map, uh, it's been studied by US Air Force cartographers, and their view uh, is that what we're actually seeing there is the subglacial topography of Antarctica, Antarctica as it looks underneath the ice that now covers it. And this raises the question, how long has Antarctica been covered with the two-mile-thick ice cap that we now presently see on it? 
such questions would be irrelevant if there were no other maps in this category. If the piri reis map stood alone, the most sensible thing to do would be to dismiss it as a coincidence. But it doesn't stand alone. There's hundreds of other maps that incorporate this same information at a time when our civilization had not yet acquired that information. Uh, this is the Mercator map. Mercator is rather famous for his Mercator projection that still dominates most atlases today. It's a 16th century map, and um, it shows Antarctica 300 years before Antarctica was discovered. And again, it's based on earlier source maps, and again, it incorporates accurate relative longitudes. So also the Orontius Phineas map that we're looking at here, another 16th century map. Mercator includes it in one of his atlases. And here we see Antarctica looking a little bit different with mountains clearly visible along the coast and rivers running down from those mountains in places where great glaciers are known to run today. It looks on this map as though Antarctica is partially deglaciated. The center of the continent appears to be featureless and ice covered, but the coast is showing these unglaciated features. What might that mean? This is a map by Philippe Bouache, uh, an 18th century geographer, still a good hundred years before the discovery of Antarctica. And it shows the continent as a kind of archipelago, two major land masses divided by a clear waterway running between them. I wonder where he got that idea from. There's a redrawing of the Mercator map and the Orontius Phineas map and the Buash map. And here to the right, based on seismic surveys conducted in International Geophysical Year in 1958, is a view of what Antarctica actually looks like underneath all that ice that now covers it. We're looking at the subglacial landscape of Antarctica here. And while I wouldn't claim for a moment that the Buash map is a perfectly accurate representation of the subglacial topography of Antarctica, I think it's much too close to the reality uh, to be dismissed entirely. I think that much more research needs to be done into these anomalous early maps and into the source maps that they rely upon for their information because we just may be looking at the faint fingerprints of a lost civilization, of a navigating, seafaring civilization that explored and mapped the entire globe long before what we call history began. The issue of the glaciation of Antarctica is a controversial one, and most scholars would say that it has been covered with ice uh, in the form that we see it today for several millions of years. But there is some contradictory evidence, deep sea cores which bring up uh, soils from the ocean bed, uh, which suggest that rivers carrying fine-grained sediments were indeed running down off the coastline of Antarctica until about 10,000 years ago. Maybe that's the period we should be looking at. Maybe something happened in the world around then that we don't fully understand. And in my view, this whole mystery is intimately connected to the mystery of the last ice age and what an ice age is and why the last ice age came suddenly and traumatically to an end at around 12 or 14,000 years ago. You have ice sheets, six million square miles of ice covering northern Europe, two miles thick as far south as London. You have a similar mass of ice covering much of North America as far south as the Mississippi Delta, almost into the tropics. This ice is stable for 100,000 years. And then suddenly, almost in the blink of an eye, it all melts. Within just 1,000 or 2,000 years, it's all gone. Sea levels have gone up by 